Mm -mm -mm. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for being a couple of minutes late. I was looking for a film on YouTube. Up a little bit late. All right. Dumpty, dumpty, dum. Morning, everybody. Do do. I was so impressed, Jess, by your getting my uh, Wally reference in lab yesterday. Thinking about that this morning. I was just watching it the other night. That's why. Is that what? That's really cool. <laughs> it's one of my fave fave animated films. Mm -hmm. Contamination. Contaminant. <laughs> uh, no, I don't want that. I want. Where are we? Ah, here we go. All right, so crap, I actually forgot where I didn't check where we're at. I think we ended up with this. Right, we didn't start splicing, did we? No. Okay, cool. All right, so essentially we went over the kind of the overview, right? The different processes, which is capping, splicing, and polyadenylation. Right, those are the three, the three things that are required before an mRNA can be considered mature and be exported to the cytoplasm. So that's five prime capping, splicing out of introns, and oops, I spell it right, of the three prime. All those together equals what's called a mature transcript. Right. So we have, I think we've covered capping, right? The adding of, let's stick that over there. The adding of this uh, seven methyl guanine group, right? Ah, here's a, here's a test. What effect does that have? on the mRNA. What does that do to the mRNA when it's added to the five prime N? What's the purpose? There's actually two reasons for having the cap. But in terms of RNA stability, what, what does this cap do? Good from being degraded by RNAs. That's right, it does. Why, why is it no longer able to be degraded by an RNAs? You're correct, but why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at this. Does this look like anything that you'd recognize as being RNA? Kinda, right? A little bit, right? We've got a ribose, we've got a guanine. We've got all this weird stuff. Right, tons of methyl groups which aren't normally in RNA, stuff like that. So this doesn't look like RNA, right? So if you're an RNA is kind of scooching around in the nucleus, then, or even in the cytoplasm, and you see this, you would not immediately recognize that as being RNA. And so enzymes are very specific typically for their substrate, and they often do it, that specificity comes from uh, shape, charge, all kinds of different kind of characteristics. So if you futz around with any of those, typically it stops being uh, able to fit, right? That whole kind of, you know, lock and key or hand and glove kind of analogy of enzyme function. Oh yeah, dogs coming down. Clatter, 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 bang. Yeah, that's why they've been pestering me. They haven't had their breakfast. Okay, so this also, right, in addition to uh, what you just said, this is also a binding site for the ribosome or part of the ribosome, which we'll get to uh, maybe today, actually. We're going to start tra translation today, I think. Uh, when we uh, start on that. Okay, now splicing, however, is a much more kind of complex process. 
And basically, it re relies on a bunch of what are called ribonucleoproteins. And so, rib and I, I love actually looking at the kind of the origin or breakdown of words. And science is really good for that. Actually, you know, language in general is actually pretty neat. Um, but science is super cool because we're very like straight laced, you know, generally speaking. Uh, straightforward people so ribonucleo proteins equals ribos in rna oops nucleo equals nucleus and obviously protein is pretty self-explanatory right that's, that's not particularly difficult oops if i can spell protein there you go Right, so these are protein RNA complexes in the nucleus that recognize introns and remove them. Right. And actually, this, <laughs> many of you are not of legal drinking age, so kind of close your ears uh, when I talk about this stuff. Has anybody ever had schnapps? Yay, cool. It's super yummy. Uh, it's a German liqueur, apricot brandy, I think. I don't, can't quite remember. Anyway, you pronounce schnurps the same way you pronounce schnapps. So schnurps are small nuclear ribonuclear protein particles. That's why we call them schnurps, because saying small nuclear ribonuclear protein particles a lot is not fun. Actually, typing it really sucks. So I only ever type it once. That's in the PowerPoint. Right, never again. So these are the uh, kind of protein RNA complexes, right? And ribosomes are also protein RNA complexes that uh, make up what's called the spliceosome, right? And the sp spliceosome equals the complex, and there's a lot of proteins involved that splices out introns. And again, I've got to kind of can't stress highly enough how important it is to remove those introns. If an intron remains, that protein will be junk. Actually, there's a couple of reasons for that. I need to tell the other classes too. Just remembering. Go on, breakfast dog. Go on. So if a intron is not spliced out and i'll talk about why that might happen a little bit then you get two things translation continues into the intron right remember the intron is not coding for protein it's still mrna right so it still can be translated because the ribosome isn't going to know whether it's an intron or not, right? All it sees is mRNA and just reads it in chunks of three. So if the intron is still there, now we have information present which shouldn't be present, right? And so that uh, protein is going to be nonsense, right? It's going to be a whole bunch of amino acids that shouldn't be present in a protein, right? Or that particular protein. Also, introns are not under um, selective constraint, right? So you can do almost whatever you like to an intron, right? You can slice it, you can stick stuff in, you can take stuff out, right? Not going to have any effect on the protein because it doesn't code for protein, right? And so in the intron, you'll have stop codons. Right. Stop codons are what terminate translation, hence stop codon. You will also have stop codons in frame, and we'll talk about what that means later, but we can just take it face value for now, with the preceding intron, uh, exon, sorry. Look at that. 
spell check always thinks proceeding isn't a word. I'm sure it is. Anyway. Equals truncated. Oops. Protein. Right. So both of those things will result in a protein that does not function at all. Right. We're not talking about small change, which might change an amino acid or might change the specificity of a protein or something like that. Right. We're talking about a catastrophic. That protein is dead. Right. So this is an extraordinarily important process that has to happen correctly. Because if it doesn't, and you have your homozygous recessive for that mutation, that, that protein is not going to function. That gene will be uh, a loss of function. OK, so there's a bunch of stuff going on. Uh, we have our uh, aging Irish rockers, you two. That's my bad joke of the day. Uh, don't know what happened to you three and uh, others. Who knows? But anyway, we've got five uh, different schnurps, and they all have different jobs, right? And before we get into like how it works, I just want to show you what an intron kind of looks like. And so introns have, well, there are what are called splice sites or splice junctions at the beginning and the end of an intron. These have what's called a consensus sequence. So we've met this before when we were looking at transcription, right, in terms of the minus 10 and minus 35 sequences in bacteria and the tata box in eukaryotes. So what this actually, so this is kind of funny because I used to look for introns before we had computers to do the job, which was a while ago. And you're always looking for a GUAG. Right. G U at start, A G at end of intron. Right. And so that's what, you know, in terms of computers, like if you're doing bioinformatics, that's what that uh, gene structure searching program looks for. Right. These are called consensus sequences, right? We've come across that before. And what this actually means. Other than the fact this is what you find most commonly, right? What this means is that these are exceptionally important bases. Because if these uh, change by random mutation, which occurs, you know, randomly, right? There's a role of DNA replication and stuff like that. If these change, that allele that mutation is strongly selected against because it will kill the protein and so if that protein is important which typically they are right that mutation will be lost very very quickly from the population because any organism that has it is not going to be very successful it's going to be less fit right so less likely to reproduce or survive to reproduction past that mutation onto its offspring. So these see these bases, you know, the single letters on the left, in the middle, and on the right. If those change, this doesn't work. All right. So basically, over the course of uh, evolution, and we're talking about. Wow, when did you carrots first appear? I remember back like two billion years ago, give or take. Right? These bases have not changed. Right. So that shows you how important, right? This is just like another way of looking at this, right? This is not just a sequence of letters. This is something that's so important that you never see it changing. Right is highly highly conserved right and so these are the uh, sequences 
that are recognized by the schnurps. Right? And actually, not so much in, in this, but in uh, ribosomal RNA, what's used in ribosomes to make proteins, uh, the same process applies, right? They're very highly conserved. And so you can actually use those as a molecular clock. So if you want to look at evolution relationships between different species, like when they diverged, stuff like that, you will look at their highly conserved stuff because they change really slowly, right? You know, really, really slowly. And so you can kind of calibrate that with a fossil record and figure out, you know, how many millions of years ago those organisms diverged, which is just kind of fun. Anyway, and this A point A here is really important, as we'll see in a second. If anyone has any questions, just, you know, feel free to stop me. Uh, Otherwise, I'll, you know, just chunter on up and up and up, uh, talking about this stuff. Okay, so this is the simple view. Uh -huh. Before we kind of add any of the schnurps in. And so the basic process, as we understand it, uh, at the moment at least, is that in our pre-RNA, obviously, we have our five prime and our three prime splice site or splice junction. The first thing that happens is that five prime junction is cut, right? So the intron is physically severed, right, from the first exon and it's peeled back and stuck back to itself to make what's called a lariat, like yeehaw, cowboys, you know, catching cows and stuff. At the same time, exon one is still kept close by because you don't want it just kind of flowing off into the distance because you'll never get it back again. Right. This uh, loop is formed. It's actually kind of one of those interesting characteristics of RNA. So you remember we talked about RNA having a two prime hydroxyl group, right? That's why it's ribonucleic acid, whereas DNA doesn't. That's why it's called deoxy ribonucleic acid, right? This two prime OH is now used. So you can see that the five prime phosphate that was over here, right? At the five prime end of the intron is looped back and it's stuck to the two prime OH of that A at the branch point. So you couldn't do this with DNA, not that you'd want to, you couldn't do a DNA because DNA doesn't have that two prime OH, only RNA does. So that's kind of like a neat uh, use of that uh, feature. Now, once that Lariat loop is formed, now the three prime end is cut that releases this lariat, this intron, which is essentially just broken down and recycled, right? Those nucleotides turn back into something that could be used. And the end of exon one, hello girl, is stuck to the beginning of exon two. So it's re-ligated, that phosphodiester bond is reformed. My big dog's happy because she's had her breakfast. Are you happy? No, oh, yes, yeah, she's happy. Wagon tail. And that is the splicing of one intron. Now, as I said, eukaryotic genes vary in how many introns they have from one to, you know, a ton, basically. And all of those introns have to be removed. Actually, let's, uh, where do I have that? Oh, here you go. This is uh, what I wrote oh, one of my papers. It's always fun to look at stuff you wrote uh, many moons ago. This was 2014, I think. Hang on, get out of it. So anyway, this is a gene that I worked on for a bunch. I'm actually still doing a little bit of work on it now uh, called PNC1. And so this is a uh, producing enzyme called nicotinamidase. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to say. 
the recycles nicotinamide, which is uh, niacin, it's like a vitamin B something, into NAD, right? And you're all, freak, you're all familiar with NAD because that's involved in cellular respiration, right? It's an electron carrier. So anyway, the gene that encodes that, and I'll come back to this later because this is actually, wait, wait, where are you going? Here we go. This is actually a really good example of uh, uh, differential uh, promoters, right? So we're not gonna worry about that just for now, but you can see that this one has uh, five exons. It has one, one, two, three, four introns, and it depends on which promoters you use as to which protein you get. Right, so this is just one example. Yeah, eukaryotic genes are pretty complex, right? Or at least they can be, right? Okay, so let's get back. All right, now we're going to get into the weeds, right? Because this is uh, this is actually a very carefully choreographed process, right? As I've said already, it's an extraordinarily important process. And so let's. Ah, zoom in Oops. so I don't overwhelm you with information all at once. Okay, so first things first, we need to recognize those uh, features in the intron, right? And so that's what the first two schnurps do. U1 recognizes the five prime splice junction. And again, this is based on the sequence of the RNA at that junction, right? So this is a protein that binds to the RNA very specifically only when it finds those, that series of bases, right? That's why if any one of those bases changes, this thing doesn't work. And then we have a second one, U2, <laughs> where the streets have no name. Um, which recognizes the branch point, right? So those bind, then the rest come in, right? Now we form the spliceosome essentially. And this comes in after U1 has cut the five prime end of the intron free, right? So you remember that kind of bending round formation of that loop. So these other schnurps, U1 is no longer needed. U4 kind of like brings the lot in. These other schnurps now stick the five prime end to that A. Remember, U2 is still there. They keep hold of exon one, right? Because again, you don't want that to disappear. You want to keep that pretty close by. And Essentially, this whole lot, the spliceosome, cuts exon two, right, and releases this whole RNA protein, ribonucleic protein complex, and religates exon one back into the transcript. And so it's a very carefully choreographed process. Recognition. Schnurps coming in, cutting, formation of this complex, right, where we have still all the pieces that we had before, exon one, two, and the intron, and then a careful kind of reshuffling where exon one is stuck onto exon two, and the intron is uh, displaced with all of the spliceosome proteins. Anybody got questions? Give you a few moments to absorb that. Does that make sense? Now it's pretty unlikely I'm going to ask you, you know, what are the specific functions of all the individual different schnurps? but I will expect you to know what role they play in general. Um, what does U4, 5, and 6 do again? 
So U4 basically brings in the rest of the schnurps, right? So you can see U4 leaves once this lysosome forms. Now U5, U6, and U2, U2 is involved in um, basically bringing U6 to form this loop, right? So U2 kind of sits there, recognizes the branch point, and that's what uh, is used like a scaffold essentially, right? To bring in the five prime end of the intron and have it stuck to that adenine, right? Which is what uh, U6 does. And U5 basically keeps the exon one and exon two in close proximity. And I'm pretty sure it's what does the cleavage of the three prime site. I'm not like super expert on um, schnurps, to be honest. So all together, these three are uh, referred to as a spliceosome. And they're what catalyze the remaining two tasks of splicing. One is to cleave this the three prime end, this one just here, where the little red arrow is. And the second task, obviously, in addition to keeping X on one around, is to stick the three prime end of X on one to the five prime end of X on two. So U4 is just a um, kind of like a messenger, essentially, right? Just brings everything in. These three. U2, U5, and U6 are what finish the job that was started up here by U1. So it's basically a sequential series of events. Oops. U1 and U2 binding, five prime end and the branch point. The rest of the ribonucleoprotein proteins coming in. U1 has done its job because it's cut the five prime end, doesn't have anything else to do. And then uh, the three prime end is cut and re-ligation of the exon, exons back together. So it all happens in that kind of choreographed order. Did that make sense? Yes, thank you. And this is actually a good example of one of those, you know, big picture and detail uh, concepts, essentially. You know, you need to understand in general how important splicing is because an awful lot of stuff really hinges on that. But it also helps to understand the details because that will fill out essentially that concept. It'll also, you know, kind of reinforce the, the point of how important those splice junctions are in terms of their sequence, right? Because if, you know, you don't have the correct sequence, U5 won't recognize the three prime uh, splice site. U1 won't recognize the five prime one. So that's kind of a way of taking those details and putting them back in the bigger picture. All right, well, if anything else occurs, just, you know, stop me. I really don't mind going back and going over stuff. I really do not. It, I love having questions. Because I really want you to, you know, really get this. I want you to get into the exam and go, yeah, I know this stuff, right? That's the aim of the game. Okay, so the last thing that needs doing before export. So again, remember, this is all happening in the nucleus, right? Translation happens in the cytoplasm, right? So this is the last step. And this is actually really tied into termination of transcription two, or as well. Where are we at? Down here. So if you remember, 
determination transcription in eukaryotes is all about uh, rat one chewing up the kind of the unused bit of the transcript, right? And it does so because the nascent transcript, the pre-mRNA, right, is cut by an enzyme, an endonuclease, kind of after the, you know, uh, important bit of the gene is produced, right? And so that free three prime end, that serves as the site of polyadenylation, adding lots of A's. And there can be a lot of them, like up to a hundred, right? I don't know if anyone's ever actually measured them, probably, but there can be a lot of those A's, right? So the first step in uh, processing of the three prime end is really like the last step of transcription, if you think about it. The last step being termination is the beginning of the adding of the poly A tail, right? Because you need that free three prime end to add the tail to. And so again, as we talked about at the beginning, this is because any free, free kind of floating around end of mRNA is a target for RNases, right? So just as the five prime end is capped, so it doesn't look like RNA, the three prime end has a tail added so that it can be protected from RNases. Does that make sense? I don't know what that is. And I'll get into how this is protected in, in a little bit. And so this is the uh, sequence that's recognized by the endonuclease, right? That cuts the pre mRNA. And it cuts it here uh, just before this U rich sequence. I'm not entirely sure what the significance of that is, to be honest. Anyway. That leaves a uh, free three prime end and an enzyme called, ah, actually, if we're pon polyadenylating something, what do you think the enzyme's called that does it? Adenylase? Yeah, <laughs> isn't it awesome? It's like uh, when I went to uh, Columbia when I was a uh, just after graduating from university. Um, my uncle said, it's fine, Matt, you don't know how to speak Spanish, but don't worry, just add an O or an A to the end of every English word, and ah, you're speaking Spanish. Now, obviously any of you that actually speak Spanish knows that that's not true, and it didn't help me very much. But in science, you can do that, right? You can add A's to the end of a word, and that's the enzyme that does that thing. So the enzyme that does that is polyadenylase. Right? You can actually buy it on right, a little tube. So if you want to add uh, a, a poly A tail to uh, RNA that you're making, you just add that enzyme and a bunch of A's. So this still, you're probably thinking, hang on, well, this is just RNA two, right? Why does this protect the three prime end? And the reason is it's recognized by proteins. Ha, ah, what proteins, here you go. This is kind of fun. What proteins do you think bind to the poly A tail? What do you think they're called? Remember, we're not a very imaginative bunch of molecular biologists. What proteins bind to the poly A tail? Come on. Someone be brave. I can see Jesus is like, ooh, should I? Should I? Poly A binding proteins. <laughs> yeah, you got it, Sophia. Just got to add a binding in there and you're good, right? It's super funny. It's like we're, in some ways, the most literal people. Exactly. So, Poly A binding proteins bind 
to the poly A A tail. And in doing so, protect it from RNases. Right. So they don't change the RNA itself, like which the five prime cap does. They just kind of, you know, glom onto it and uh, hide it from RNases. And actually, it's really interesting that how, how those poly A binding proteins are uh, controlled is one big way in which the stability of the transcript is controlled. So not all transcripts are equal. Some of them you want to hang around for a long time. So, I don't know, things like uh, ribosome, mRNAs that encode ribosomes, right? You always need them. You know, you just keep making them, replace them as they break down, stuff like that. So those are very stable, long-lived transcripts. Others, you might need only transiently for a short amount of time. So things like... Uh, you know, a signal to turn on a particular set of genes or something like that, trans transcription factor, right? And so those get turned on and then get turned off really quickly. And so those transcripts are very short-lived. Almost as soon as they're produced, right, they get a, like a brief shot of being translated and then they're degraded, they're, they're chopped up. And one of the ways in which the lifespan of a transcript is controlled is through poly A binding proteins. Basically, as if you kick them off, then all the RNAs just go, ooh, yum, and they come in and they degrade transcripts. There are other mechanisms of uh, targeting transcripts for degradation, but that's one of them. So, yeah, it's really, it's one thing that I always like to get across whenever I teach really any kind of course in molecular biology or genetics or, you know, development, stuff like that, is that the cell or organism, anything, right? Biology in general is incredibly dynamic process, right? Where all of this stuff happens kind of all at the same time, right? And that's what makes it so interesting. Right, it's not just da 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 da, right? And that's what it will be. There's this constant dynamism between genes being turned on, transcripts being degraded, proteins being processed or modified, right? It's just this, it's almost a process so complicated it cannot be understood, right? Almost. And that's why, in many ways, you have to break it down into much smaller chunks. Otherwise, you simply get overwhelmed by the complexity. Really, it's just like this kind of, like Alice looking through the looking glass, right? You just kind of look through and go, holy shit, there's just crazy stuff going on in there. It's really cool. As you can see, I'm a fan. Okay, so again, going back to uh, what we talked about in transcription for eukaryotic gene structure, right? There are, even in a mature transcript, there are different regions, right? So obviously we have the coding region. So, uh, ba -da -ba -do. the protein is a bit of terminology here. Protein coding region is obviously the region that codes for protein, right? It's kind of self-explanatory. That's also called the open reading frame for re reasons for which it will make sense in a bit. Or ORF, not to be confused with ALF, the likes eating cats. Most of you are probably too young to get that reference, which is kind of sad, but that was a real fun sitcom back in the, I don't know, 90s. Anybody seen ALF? no one oh that's sad that makes me feel old anyway 
moving swiftly on. And we also have, it's really fun. Oh, yay. Way to go, Cynthia. Super funny. If you want like a pleasant chortle, go watch ALF. It's all about, it stands for alien life form. It's basically like this alien that comes and lives with this like regular suburban American family and spends most of its time trying not to eat their cat because it really likes cats. Eating them, that is. Anyway, um, it's also called coding sequence. Mm -mm -mm. Quick segue back to molecular biology. No way, does it? That's cool. I might have to check that out. I haven't seen that for a long, long time. Anyway, not right now, because you've got to focus, focus. Stop thinking about Alf. And that is shortened to CDS. ta -da. All right, so all those things mean the same thing, right? That's the region of the transcript, usually somewhat in the middle, uh, that encodes the protein. And it's bookended by the start codon, which is an AUG. We'll actually come across this in lab, which is super neat. And that uh, codes for methionine, uh, shortened to MET. And uh, start codon, uh, there, stop codon, which is a UAA, UAG, ah, that's the other one, UGA. There you go. I always remember two out of three. And that stops translation, right? So there's start and stop, right? Straightforward. There's also upstream of the start codon, so before it, essentially, we use terms upstream and downstream uh, and talking about DNA and RNA and stuff. Five prime UTR. Ah, can anybody? <laughs> oh, bugger, it's there. There you go. The hand of God comes into play. What does the UTR stand for? change this, the slide because it was on there. Actually, you can just change it back yourself. Don't know why I'm feeling so smug about that. What does the UTR stand for? You have one at the beginning and the end of a transcript. What does it stand for? Come on. Okay, I'll give you the U. Un. So it's not part of the translated region. It's not part of the coding sequence or the open reading frame. So if it's not translated, it is an un. Transcripted. Oh, no, it is a transcript, right? Because transcript is mRNA. You're on the right track, though. What's the thing that happens after transcription and processing? It begins with a T as well. How do you make protein? Translated. Yay. Thank you, everybody. It's the untranslated region, right? So... And the reason why I changed slides is because it's just there. So that wouldn't have been anywhere near as much fun, right? So five prime UTR is the un five prime untranslated region. And it's untranslated because it doesn't code for protein, right? It's a bit of the transcript, which has no, well, yeah, it's just not translated. I'm not gonna say it doesn't have any part in translation, right? And that is involved or uh, used for the initiation, uh, come on, of translation. And then you have a three prime UTR at the other end. And these can be of varying lengths, right? This kind of, basically you want enough for it to be functional, but not so much that it's a waste. Uh, 
few hundred base pairs from memory. It's a long time since I've looked at one. Uh, I'd say probably you know two to five hundred base pairs long for the five prime, maybe a couple of hundred bases for the three prime. And that's the obviously three prime untranslated region. This is also ah, sort of used for, well, actually is, sorry, not sort of. Used for the control of translation and uh, transcript stability. So even though they don't code for protein, they are still very important. All right. And that will look like this uh, kind of chicken scratch and drawing. I should actually get around to doing a like a more professional version at some point, uh, but this will do. So this is basically what a mature eukaryotic mRNA transcript looks like. Five prime cap, five prime UTR, coding sequence, start, stop codons, three prime UTR, poly A tail. This is now finished and can be exported to the cytoplasm where it will be translated. Ta -da. And the cool thing is that in our bioinformatics part of the, um, the Drosophila cloning, yellow gene cloning experiment, we'll actually be looking at these features of the yellow gene as well. Which is super neat. So you'll actually get to see uh, see that. Now, what I was looking for was a real neat video of translation. I think I found it just before starting class. So anyway, that's that's the end of essentially producing a transcript, right? So again, in prokaryotes, <clears throat> you don't have any of this processing. As soon as the ribosome binding site of an mRNA is uh, available. Ribosomes will bind to it and start translating it, even as the transcript is still being synthesized by RNA polymerase. Right, this, uh, where to go down here somewhere. Basically this, right. And so in prokaryotes, translation is already well underway before the transcript is even finished right potentially by multiple ribosomes as well right and so that's really good for bacteria because a they you know they don't have a nucleus so they don't have to get it out of anywhere and also they can scale up gene expression very quickly and produce lots of stuff right and so if you're somewhat at the mercy of your environment being able to produce whatever you need to survive in that environment very quickly is a big plus, right? So bacteria are very good at scaling up gene expression very quickly, right? Eukaryotes, not so much. We're kind of a little bit more measured, I guess. There anyway, we go. Okay, so. Moving on to translation. Actually, let's have a little pause here. Let people cogitate. Anybody got questions or clarifications or anything like that about any of this jazz? So one thing that I do tend to focus on a fair bit, I guess, in the exams are the comparisons between prokaryotes and eukaryotes because right, they have not just because it's a point of comparison but because it actually ties in to their biology in many ways right so understanding the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes as well as their shared like common aspects is uh, pretty important one of the things that i do focus on and also one thing that can catch students out too you know, so if I ask you a question about, you know, RNA processing, 
without even thinking about it, you know that I'm talking about you carrots. So if there's an answer in there that says something to do with prokaryotes or bacteria, you know that that's immediately wrong, right? Because prokaryotes don't process their mRNA. Okay, anybody got questions, clarifications? Don't all speak at once. When's our next exam? Uh, for you lot, it is next Thursday. So a week from today. Let me just double check that. So I sound confident, but I have a terrible memory. Yeah, it's next uh, Thursday, Thursday the 4th. So what we have left to do kind of from this section is translation, which is a non-trivial thing. But yeah, that's what's left. And it will be a tough one too. No sugar coating it. Because there's a lot of stuff to absorb. A lot of details. Will we get more time on this exam? Nope. Sorry. Oh, I should I should <laughs> be a little less less harsh. Uh no, but there will be a bunch of um it's going to be a little different. So if you remember back to exam two, like the kind of more uh, detail type questions, like on DNA replication, stuff like that, it will be a lot more of that. Right. So uh, there will be a bunch of straight up basic recall questions, right, which should be fairly straightforward if you just know your stuff, right? So, uh, you know, what's the what's the protein coding region of a transcript called? Is it called a five prime UTR or CDS or three prime UTR or poly A tail, for example? It's a CDS, right? You just know that it's right there in front of you. So there will be a bunch of those questions, which as long as you're kind of all this stuff makes sense will be really easy to answer. Potentially. And there obviously will be more complex questions too. Lots of order of events as well, because as I've talked about stuff, Sayed, you're having far too much fun. Uh, <laughs> this is not hilarious. He's almost crying with tears. Hey. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so there will be a lot of kind of like orders of events and stuff like that. I have a feeling that he's not just watching me because I'm not that funny. Anyway, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. same number of questions, same amount of time. Uh, but there will be a bunch of what should hopefully be really straightforward, like quick answer. Oh, it's that, it's that, it's that type questions. As long as you're kind of fully familiar and comfortable with the material, it, those shouldn't pose any difficulty. Cool. All right. So translation. Essentially, there's a, a bunch of stuff, right? As always, right? That's kind of essential, like molecular biology in a nutshell. There's a bunch of stuff. And these are the kind of the key parts. And so one of the things that's absolutely crazy about translation is the actual concept of translation. You're translating information in terms of bases, A's, U's, C's, and G's. You've got four different possible letters at any position. And we translate that, and it's literally a translation, right? Because we go from nucleic acid in the forms of bases to amino acid sequence 
right? So we're not going from DNA to RNA, which is pretty much kind of going from, you know, like white toast to brown toast. You know, it's kind of the same thing, essentially, just slightly different format. We're going from something complete to something completely different, right? And so it is literally a translation. It's like I often use the example of the Rosetta Stone. I don't know if anybody have heard of that, right? It's how uh, Egyptologists were able to translate hieroglyphics because without an, like an ancient Egyptian, you know, next to you, hieroglyphics don't make any sense, right? They're like pictorial craziness, basically, right? And so the Rosetta Stone, which was found in Rosetta, was I think it's a tablet which had both hieroglyphics and like Sumerian or you know something else some kind of like uh, Indo uh, origin uh, language on it, right? And so it acted as a bridge, right? And so the whole deal of translation is bridging between the nucleic acid information, right? RNA form into a kind of functional complex three-dimensional structure, which is the protein. And the crazy thing is as well, don't forget, we've got four bits of information, literally bits, like, you know, zeros and ones would be computer, A's, U's, C's and G's would be molecular. And there's actually effort to make a DNA-based uh, memory chip. Don't know whether they're still working on that, but anyway. And 20 different amino acids, right? So we go from fairly simple information to a lot more complexity. And it is very specific, right? You can only put one particular amino acid where you're told to for one particular codon, right? So it's actually quite an astonishing process. You know, when I said that transcription is pretty dull, you know, it's just like of making a transcript. Translation is not. Translation is way more complicated, right? Because you're going from one thing to another, right? And so essentially the intermediary here, right? The Rosetta Stone, essentially, or the translator is the transfer RNA, these things. And so their RNA, and so they can recognize RNA, they can base pair with RNA, right? And they do so with a little bit of it called an anticodon. So tRNAs recognize, oops, mRNA via their anticodon, right? And they carry a very specific amino acid at their other end, right? So tRNAs are literally the translator. It shouldn't be transfer RNA, it should be translator RNA, right? Because they're the bridge between RNA and protein or RNA and amino acid. They're really what makes this whole thing work. Now, obviously, we've got the mRNA, right? Because that's the information that's uh, going to be used to create the polypeptide. We've got uh, ribosomes, which are riboproteins, right? So they are a complex of RNA and protein. And actually, ribosomes are a complex complex <laughs> of protein and our RNA. And it's the our RNA that is the enzyme. Remember, I talked about uh, RNA can be both the uh, store of information or contain information and act as an enzyme these are called ribozymes 
And the last bit, which is also critical, is the enzymes that add the amino acids to the tRNAs. These are a bit of a mouthful. They're amino acyl tRNA synthetases. Mm. And they do that in a very specific manner, right? So they use the anticodon to add the correct amino acid to that tRNA. So even before we dive into the details, you can see there's like a whole ton of stuff going on. Now, just to do a little refresher, right? So what amino acid looks like, I think we talked about this maybe, I can't remember if it was this section or another. Um, amino acids consist of an amino group, right? So again, remember, talked about directionality of proteins, I think. So the me, no group equals the N terminus or start of the protein. Actually probably better put polypeptide first. Right. The carboxyl group at the end. Oops, let's see if I can type this out. That's the C terminus or end of the polypeptide. Right, so in, in, in an individual amino acid, you've got an amino group, you've got what's called an alpha carbon, you've got a carboxyl group, right? These are common to all amino acids, right? It's like the phosphate and sugar group of nucleic acids, right? They're all the same, right? And actually this forms in the same way as you've got the phosphate sugar backbone, right? Which is the kind of repeats of phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar that make up the backbone of RNA and DNA. You have the amino group carbon, yeah, it's not quite as easy to say, the N, the C, the N, the, the N, the CC, the N, the CC, NCC, kind of uh, repeats in a uh, polypeptide. Now the R groups, and we'll get back to polypeptide in a little bit. The R groups are what make the amino acids different, is what give the amino acids their properties. Right, and what make them different from each and one another. And these properties are utterly critical to the function and shape of a protein. And in proteins, shape equals function, typically. Right. So you can have a bunch of different properties. Actually, let me just type them out here. Well, so R group and also essentially amino acid properties equals charge, positive or negative, right? So um, these can be acidic or basic, hydro. Obesity, water hating, or hydro, these are not easy words to type, water loving. Here's an interesting question. So given that the cytoplasm of a cell is an aqueous environment, right? Aqueous meaning that there's lots of water around, whether it's free water or water kind of 
you know, attached to other stuff. What type of amino acid would you tend to find on the surface of a protein? Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? What sort of amino acid will you find on the surface of a protein? If that protein is in an aqueous environment. Hydrophilic? Yes, it's going to be hydrophilic. Exactly. So conversely, what would you expect to find in the center of a protein? Hydrophobic. Exactly. The opposite, right? And in way tangent, if we dropped you in the Mariana's Trench, other than you not being very happy about it, one of the reasons why proteins stop working at high pressure or, uh, you know, uh, hyperbaric pressure is because water gets forced into the center of proteins where it doesn't want to be and actually forces those proteins apart, right? Because the center of proteins is typically hydrophobic, right? So just those two properties, hydrophilic versus hydrophobic, right? kind of essentially dictate where you're going to find those amino acids and how that protein interacts with its environment, right? Right, so that's incredibly important. Uh, if you think about uh, kind of iron channels in your cells, right? The channel itself is almost certainly going to be charged, right? That's how we uh, allow certain ions through and not others, for example, right? So all of these properties are super, super important. And then you also have uh, size, right? Some R groups are teeny tiny, e.g. Uh, glycine has an H. Others are mahusive, which is a word, I'm sure. E.g., I don't know, like arginine. Right. So that they physically occupy more space. And also there's uh, kind of the types of bonds that they can form. Van der Waals, uh, hydrogen bonds, those are more the hydrophilic residues, right? So between OHs and Hs and NHs, things like that. Uh, what else we got? We've got ionic bonds. Uh, that's going to be between acidic and basic residues. And you can also have one covalent bond. And those are called disulfide Oop, do bridges. Uh, let's not spell that way between uh, cysteine residues, right? And I've written them out in increasing order of strength as well. So the types of bonds and kind of where they're at and their strength also plays a very important role in the structure, function, stability, and so on of the proteins. So, as a, again, I'm not going to expect you to memorize this uh, thing because I don't either, uh, because I can just look it up, right? So this, in my mind, is uh, like what a tyrosine has for an R group is not interesting. The properties of tyrosine, however, are very interesting, right? 
you know, it's able to form hydrogen bonds. It's actually a pretty large R group because it's got this uh, cyclic uh, aromatic carbon. Um, and actually these kind of aromatic carbons are also really important in uh, kind of sharing electrons around. So something like uh, chlorophyll, for example, or other kinds of uh, carotenoid pigments, stuff like that. Uh, even heme in hemoglobin, right? You know, it binds oxygen based on, you know, funky sharing of electrons and stuff. So that kind of stuff I'm very interested in, right? What these actually are, like their names, like what their actual structures are, less so, because you can just look at this, right? So that kind of gives you a hint. I'm not going to be asking you what asparagine has for a side group. I might be showing you an amino acid and saying, what's its properties going to be? Hint, hint. Wink, wink. Okay, and so essentially, you join all of those things together in different orders, different amino acids, and that generates a polypeptide, right? So these are strings, right? So this is a very basic, pardon me, order of structure of amino acids. That's not a protein. Proteins are three-dimensional functional things. Polypeptide chain is simply the order of the amino acids in a line in sequence of that protein. And they're all joined together by peptide bonds. Right? And peptide bonds essentially form between the carboxyl group of the preceding, that word again, uh, amino acid and the amine group of the next amino acid, right? So these are made in a specific order, right? Just as nucleotides get added to the three prime end, amino acids get added to the C terminal end of a either peptide or polypeptide. And so once that bond forms, right, we take the water out, now we have a peptide bond. And so a polypeptide is literally the sequence of those amino acids, right? And as you can see, the backbone is the same. It's the R groups that differ. All right, I think that's enough for now. Next Thursday, we've got all of that to cover. So have a read ahead, as always. A lot of stuff to cover, a lot of information, a lot of concepts. And we'll go through that on Tuesday. All right, have a lovely weekend. It is a beautiful day. I'm gonna take the dogs for a walk uh, when I leave this. And I'll see you all soon. Take care, have fun. See you later.